In today's episode, we are reviewing the IBM Watson Studio new feature called Auto AI or Auto Automated Artificial Intelligence. Now, before we begin, full FTC disclosures. My company, Trust Insights, is an IBM registered business partner. We receive compensation for any purchases you make from IBM through us, and thus I receive indirect financial benefits. So, FTC closures, disclosures out of the way. Auto AI is a type of automated machine learning, which promises to help companies get to working artificial intelligence models faster. Given a data set, uh, instead of the time it takes to go from uh, data cleaning, uh, prep, <clears throat> uh, feature engineering, hyperparameter op optimization, uh, model experimentation, and then to production, that can, depending on your data set, take a really long time. Auto AI promises to help companies uh, do that in less time. Uh, now, before we begin, there are both features and disadvantages of this approach. There is, even though it can be very manual uh, and tedious, there is some benefit. I actually personally think there's a ton of benefit to manually editing and cleaning your data set of uh, and, and doing the feature engineering because it helps you get to know your data. And so if it's something that's mission critical, at least the first time through, you want to have a human do that. After that, absolutely use automated machine learning. And one of the questions that people have had over uh, over the last uh, few months is, you know, will this replace data scientists? Nope. And we'll talk a bit about, uh, more about that. But uh, it's not going to replace data scientists anytime soon. It will help data scientists' uh, workload get a little bit easier for the most common types of machine learning models. So let's get into the environment. <clears throat> What we see here is Watson Studio, and I'm going to fire up a, an auto AI experiment. And we'll do, we'll call this something auto test, something thoroughly exciting. And our first experiment, you see here, you, you can add in uh, testing data that we are adding training and data. I'm going to throw in, let's, uh, let's do some Google Analytics data, right? Google Analytics data is a rich source of uh, information and it's something that a lot of marketers have access to so this is going to be uh, things like users and sessions and bounces and I have goal completion so that's what I want auto AI to help me do is help me understand maybe a little bit better what gets goal completions for my Google Analytics data we see here I drop the data set in it asks me what do you want to predict what do you want to, to know more about of course I want to know more about goal completions now here's a bit of a landmine this because of the way goal completions are structured in this data set, by page, it's like, you know, one or two goals per page. So Auto AI has said, hey, I think you're trying to do a multi-class classification. I'm actually not. This is, again, why you can't fully replace the data scientists with these uh, software packages, because this is not a classification problem. This is a regression problem. And so I'll choose that. I can choose the error metric, which again, if you are a data scientist, these mean a lot to you. If you're not a data scientist, just go with whatever is recommended. Um, but this is a case where that was not the correct prediction type. So it's going to run the experiment. <clears throat> and what you'll see uh, next is if the entire pipeline of what Watson is going to do with this data. It's going to read it. It's going to split it into three pieces. Generally speaking, when you're doing model testing for AI, you're going to do you're going to split your data into three pieces. Sixty percent of it, you're going to give to the machine, and it's going to try and learn from that and figure out, oh, uh, well, this is your data. I'm going to try and learn what the patterns are. There's uh, twenty percent of it is going to be called um, test data. So once the machine first figures out, okay, I think this and this lead to conversions, it's then going to take the next twenty percent of the data set and test that that conclusion out, see if that is 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 true or not and then there's a third 20 percent where it's going to test the testing of the conclusion this way you avoid or you reduce the likelihood of what is called overfitting where you make a prediction that's perfect but then it, when new data comes in it, it, it goes off the rails so it's going to split the holdout data read the training data do uh, its own attempt at cleaning the data as best as it can None of the automated machine learning tools, zero of them on the market, do a really good job of, uh, of cleaning data perfectly. Right? That's still, the data that goes in still has to be good. 
And if it's not good and it's not in good shape, the models will simply not work. And this is true of Google AutoML. This is true of H2O AutoML. This is true of IBM Auto AI. It doesn't matter whose system you're using. Garbage in, garbage out. That's going to be the truth forever. Just garbage. So it then goes and chooses a model. What kind of machine learning model would best fit this data? Um, we see here it is chosen uh, XGBoost uh, regressor. So XGBoost is one of those popular algorithms that can help find uh, what is likely causing regression, uh, or what, is, it, what runs a regression model. XGBoost, uh, which stands for Extreme Gradient Boosting, is probably the, the most popular machine learning model for doing any kind of regression. Uh, it's won a bunch of Kaggle competitions, and it's just one in the toolkit. Now this is where auto AI has some real benefit for uh, people who are trying to learn data science. I think this is a fantastic learning tool because you can see the choices it makes. And if you're not familiar with the choice, then you go look it up and read up on it. But if you, you see the choice it makes, and then you figure, okay, that's an interesting choice. Why did it choose that? As it's going through, you can see here on the on the bottom, uh, as it makes each pipeline of learning, it tells you why it made those choices. So ranking based on the error. Um, if I click on this pipeline data, you can see how it evaluated the model, the R squared error, model information, uh, and the feature importance, what it thinks uh, is most likely to predict goal completions. And now it's going to go through a few stages of uh, really the, the, the machine learning experimentation, the exploratory process. So the first thing it's doing is hyperparameter op optimization. <laughs> Hyperparameter optimization is a really, really fancy way of saying it's going to play with the settings. So an XGBoost algorithm has a bunch of settings. It's like it's like an app on your phone, right? An app on your phone has settings. You can make this, you know, the the app louder, or you can turn off notifications or stuff. A machine learning model is a piece of software, and therefore what it's doing now is it's testing, it's running simulations to test, okay, what if I turn the brightness up on this uh, in XGBoost to be like, how many, how many uh, runs am I going to do? How many times am I going to try this thing? How many different splits of the data am I going to make? Out of the box, you know, there are certain defaults, and that, and what the software is doing is testing all of the defaults to see, do we get better error rates out of uh, this test based on uh, trying out different settings. Once it does hyperparameter optimization, it's going to do feature engineering. And this is where, uh, and I've given this feedback to IBM, I think there's a little bit of a, this is a bit of a misnomer. It does feature extraction. Feature engineering is a five part process, right? So you have the things like extraction, where it's going to try and create new features from the existing data, which is exactly what this does by doing things like multiplying columns together or dividing columns or adding or subtracting. There's a part of feature engineering that called feature creation that where you bring in net new data from the outside, this does not do that. So this is only a limited type of feature engineering. And then it does another round of now that's got more data to work with because it's created these imputed columns to do another round of hyperparameter optimization. Now this will take probably 10 or 15 minutes. So uh, we're just going to pause here and and let it do its thing and come back when it's finished baking and we're back it's been a little more than an hour and what we can see here is that watson has gone through and created four different machine learning pipelines one with just the straight uh, xg boost algorithm one with some hyperparameter optimization that tuning of all the knobs and dials on the the, uh, the different uh, xg boost models uh, one with feature engineering done, and one with hyper, at a second round of hyperparameter optimization after the feature engineering is done. So let's take a look and see what one. We see here we have four different pipelines, and with each of the enhancements, there's the straight, I just analyzed the data that you gave me, and I built a model on it. And then we see pipelines three and four have identical outcomes, the same uh, root mean squared error rate. Uh, one has feature engineering and, and hyperparameter optimization. One has both. Let's take a look at pipeline four. This has the most number of things that have happened to it. We've got a, a, a small R squared. We've got the model information. And we have a whole bunch of feature transformations that have happened. 
uh, you see through here, there's all these PCAs. That stands for um, Principal Component Analysis. Uh, it's a way of reducing the number of total features because it means uh, essentially there's too many for the machine to find a, a good conclusion from. And then, of course, some additional engineered features, users, uh, the difference between users and sessions and so on and so forth. So let's go back and look and compare now at the quote number one model, which is Pipeline 3. And we see Pipeline 3 has uh, the about the same R, actually it does have identical R squared, uh, same feature transformations as the previous one. And here it's saying that new feature 2, which is the difference between users and entrances, is the most important feature and it's moderately important with a score of 0.31 uh, for determining what const what drives or, or what predicts uh, goal completions in my Google Analytics data. <clears throat> now, if we were to look at, let's in fact look at uh, what this similar setup would look like in a different programming language. Now, this is uh, the language R, and you can see in H2O, which is the auto machine, automated machine learning model uh, that uh, runs inside of R, one of many, uh, you do the exact same thing. There's your, your training, the split data. There's your testing. There's your running your models. Then there's the leaderboard with comparison of the different types of uh, outcomes it came up with and its outcome, which was average time on page sessions and average session duration. Note what's missing here. None of the hyperparameter optimization or the feature engineering has been done on this. Uh, H2O's AutoML literally just takes what you give it, and it does its best but it doesn't do any of those extra steps. So what do you do with this, right? You've got this thing, now what What? What happens? You save this as a model inside your, uh, your Watson Studio environment, and then you deploy the model using Watson Machine Learning. That gives you a, an API, a connection that you can then send additional data into this for and have the it score and predict, like yes, will this convert, or no, will this not convert? And from that information, you would then build software. Maybe you build a special chatbot on your website that only pops up when uh, certain uh, conditions have been met, the ones that we see here in, in these models. Maybe you use this to change your marketing strategy. If you know that the difference between users and sessions is important in this model, maybe you use that information to figure out uh, what kind of user, what kind of, uh, what ki what kind of, uh, uh, person or, or session is happening on your website that you can then build additional features on your website, maybe different copy depending on, uh, on what you can come up with. So this is a useful tool for getting that model into, into production and being able to make use of it, being able to, 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 op, uh, to operationalize uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of these insights. There are still gaps. There are still things that I personally would have done differently, but there are also things in here. It's like, huh, I never thought about doing that. So this is not only a good tool for getting your model into production, but also for learning from it and going, okay, well, maybe, uh, maybe I need to think differently about the types of data I include. We see that uh, Watson is doing a lot of these mathematical operations on different variables. Okay, what if we include more variables? What if we include different variables? What if we pull more data out of Google Analytics or your Salesforce CRM or your HubSpot instance or your social media monitoring tools? doesn't matter what, but putting more data in will let the model have more to work with. Now, as we said at the beginning, this does not in any way replace a data scientist. <clears throat> there are still gotchas. There are still things that uh, it can't do within this, this framework. There are even still things that from a a modeling perspective may not be the best choice of what's available. For example, if you want to determine what drives conversions, there's a particular model that I use a lot for Trust Insights customers uh, called Markov Chains. It's not available in here. It's not available in here and it's something you have to, to build by hand. And that is a better way of doing attribution analysis, but this is not bad but there are limitations to what auto AI can do. So takeaways, <clears throat> one regression and classification built right in no code. This is, that's a, a, I think an important thing. 
and does those basic data science tasks like feature extraction and hyperparameter optimization. I think those features are really useful for someone who's learning data science, or someone who knows what kind of general outcome they want. They just want the machine to, to go through and build it quickly. Some disadvantages, obviously you're limited in the number of models that uh, Watson uh, Auto AI can choose from. There are limitations. Your data has to be good going in. You can, you've seen here, even though it does some feature engineering and it does some preparation, it does not validate, wow, this is really dumb data. Right? For example, at no point did it say, you know, those are not the columns of Google Analytics I would choose. The system simply doesn't know that, doesn't have the domain expertise. You still have to provide that domain expertise. You still have to provide those insights. And the last thing, which I know, uh, according to the team, uh, is coming at some point, is the ability to go back and tune the model and edit um, in a more granular way. It's not available in the platform yet. So should you use this? It's worth a try, especially since you can try it for free if you go to... Um, IBM's uh, data platform, dataplatform.cloud.ibm.com. Sign up for a free account, try it out, test it, see how it works. Um, there are other features within Watson Studio that you can also test out and try out. Am I going to use this to replace all the work that I do at Trust Insights? No. But am I going to use this situationally as another tool in the toolkit? Absolutely. It's one of those things that uh, is worth doing, even if just to validate my own models, to be able to, to look at it, like when I'm looking in my, uh, this auto ML model, is, did I do enough to engineer the data? The answer in this case, probably not, right? There are some more things that even I can learn from and add new features to the data sets that I already work with. So if you're learning data science and AI, great tool. If you know what you're doing, great tool. Uh, if you want to learn this, great tool. Give it a try. It doesn't cost anything to get started. And again, back to that FTC disclosure, we are an IBM registered business partner. So if you buy something from IBM through us, we do gain, uh, we do have financial benefit. Uh, as always, leave your comments in the comments box below and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and the newsletter. And we'll talk to you soon. Want help solving your company's data analytics and digital marketing problems? Visit trustinsights.ai today and let us know how we can help you.